Welcome to the Psychiatry and Psychotherapy Podcast, the podcast to help you in your journey towards becoming a wise, empathic, genuine, and connected mental health professional. I'm your host, Dr. David Pewter, a psychiatrist who splits his time practicing psychopharmacology, individual and group psychotherapy, medical director of a day treatment program, medical education research, and teaching residents and medical students. If this podcast is of interest to you and you want to deepen your understanding afterwards, you can follow the link in my show notes to my resource page, which will allow you to download a free eight-day journal assignment, which will deepen your understanding of the material and move away from negative feelings and towards gratitude. Today, I'm going to be having a discussion with one of my research associates, Adam Berecki, He is a soon-to-be fourth-year medical student who is also doing a master's in ethics. He's an incredibly brilliant, empathic, warm, um, honest, trustworthy human being that I deeply enjoy working with. And we had this idea that we would have a discussion on cognitive distortions and talk about how they apply to mental health, how we can look at our thoughts, look at our narratives, and seek to you know, move towards truth the closest we can. I will be leaving a copy of the basic cognitive distortions in the show notes. And if you have any questions or considerations, find my Instagram page and the post related to cognitive distortions, throw up a comment and I'll either address it in the comment section or possibly in a further podcast. All right, here's our interview. I am joined today with Adam Brecci. Yes, well, Brecci, you know, but common Brecci. misconception, you know. Brecci. I, I might not even know how to pronounce it myself. I, I've known you for so long, and I've never pronounced that It's a weird name. Out it's, loud. It's, yeah. <laughs> I just avoid it. <laughs> I'm a little offended. Not gonna I see a lot of last names, and I'm just like, I'm going to avoid even trying to pronounce that. Like, or you, so you work with so many people in the hospital that you just kind of cough when you say their last name, like doctor, you know, <laughs> something like that. Oh, Cause I've, I've been there. Oh, great. So today we are going to be talking about, um, a topic of cognitive distortions and kind of creating a dialogue around what are some of the different cognitive distortions and, um, yeah, so hopefully it increases your psychological mindedness. I also know it's a it's a good skill to have um, in terms of um, if you if you're sort of battling your own thoughts at times. So it both has value for yourself, but also this is a common thing that I explain to patients as a way of sort of helping them um, start to be able to. Look at some of the errors of their thinking, which changes how they feel. So can you, can you kind of like describe what you mean by cognitive distortions and where did that whole idea even come from? It, it can be found most in the psychotherapy called cognitive behavioral therapy. And so it specifically is kind of approaching the cognitions. And so the idea is you have emotions that have thoughts attached to it. And you want to kind of put those thoughts on trial. Okay. So you want to put the thoughts on trial and you want to be able to say, you know, is this the most truthful statement that I could possibly make in my mind? Okay. Do, do the thoughts that trigger these have to be like pathological or can any thoughts create some kind of distortion? Um, there, I mean, obviously I think a lot of thoughts that we have are distorted in many ways. Yeah. But what happens is as the thoughts become more and more distorted, you may become more depressed. Or if you're more depressed, your thoughts are more distorted. So you're looking through the kind of a hazy filter. Okay. And, um, so for example, all or nothing thinking. Okay. That's an example of a cognitive distortion. So things are all black and white. There's no shades of gray. For example, you think if I'm not perfect, I shouldn't try because then I would fail completely. Okay. Okay. Or, um, you know, my spouse completely hates me. Okay. Or, um, I am a horrible, horrible person. Okay. 
or I'm stupid. So it's kind of like these all or nothing statements. Okay. So what you're saying is like an event triggers, triggers me in a sense. And then I have these thoughts that I'm not necessarily choosing to think. They just kind of, or it's like a habit of, of a thought that, that appears in my brain. Is that a fair assessment? So it, it could be an event, but it also could just be your imagination. Okay. Um, it could be, you know, just like you're laying in bed at night and you can have sort of thoughts that come. And I think there's something about falling asleep, like when you start to fall asleep, that your sort of logical brain sort of shuts down and you can oh, more easily have distorted thoughts. Um, so a lot of people struggle right before they go into bed, racing thoughts. Oh, that's wild. It's like the, I don't know, the frontal lobe control kind of slowly powers down you, yeah. all the stuff that you've been suppressing all day kind of can bubble up. Is that kind of the idea? That's kind of the idea. Yeah. Especially like if you've been busy all day and making yourself busy on purpose, yeah. then you've had no time to kind of reflect Yeah. or I don't know. It just, it just happens. Like a lot of people have these sort of, um, cognitive distortions Okay. At, at right at night. Anyways, so all or nothing thinking. Like, okay. can you think of any sort of all or nothing think thoughts that come to your head? Well, yeah. Like, uh, I'm a medical student, right? And so it's. I feel like I'm constantly battling, you know, vo- internal voices, external pressures, um, whether explicit or implicit. That say, if I'm bad at this, then I'm you know a failure, or if I fail a test, you know, I'm a failure, or something like that. And, 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 you know, I, so that's an example, I think, where that doesn't generate positive emotion for me. I feel awful when something bad happens and then I berate myself. Right. And yeah. you, it, it makes sense. Like if you were to believe I am a failure, yeah, then that's a horrible feeling. Yeah. And of course you feel really, you know, sort of angry at yourself or shame or, you know, I feel bad or downcast. Yeah. Yeah. So it's interesting how like one bad experience can often inform and make it think that, you know, we go all bad on ourselves. So like why I'm going to step, take a step back here. Like why do we generate these distortions in thinking? Like why, what about, is it my childhood? Is it just patterns that I've gotten into? Like when do I get into this habit that I'm suddenly stuck in? of creating distorted thinking. Yeah. So I think it could be a number, a number of those things, right? So you could, you could have internalized an aspect of your critical parent that was berating you. And it's sort of like another, you know, sort of failure just reminds you of that. Um, you could, your personality could just be wired for more of, um, you know, perfection, and so you're just naturally, you know, wanting to do everything perfect. Yeah. And part of that kind of comes along with, you know, if, if you mess up at all, it just kind of completely destroys that image of yourself that you want to sort of hold. Yeah. Um, hmm. it, it can be like, if you are depressed or there's different, you know, sort of states where it's more easy to have negative thoughts. So you know, you may not have, if you, if you newly struggle with depression and you don't have a history of depression, all of a sudden you may have a lot more of these all or nothing think thoughts. Okay. And now so do you mean like, so you, one of the things that characterizes depression might be the presence of these cognitive distortions is it, or is that a fair assessment? Yeah, that, that's kind of what we see. Yeah. Yeah. That's what we see. Okay. Um, you know, different, different types of distortions, uh, kind of grouped together for different pathologies. So I don't know if you, we've been reading about this a little bit together. Um, if you saw that, um, there's another one called magnification or minima minimization, you know, where you basically, um, take some of your, your weaknesses or strengths and make them a lot bigger or smaller than they really are. So you're not seeing it accurately. You're not, your, your strengths, you're minimizing those usually in depression and your weaknesses, you're sort of magnifying, you know, Hmm. um, it's kind of, it kind of seems similar to all or nothing thinking, but it's just magnifying or minimizing. But if you're, 
if you struggle with like narcissism, you may magnify um, Your own, the things that you're yeah. good at and you may minimize, you know, other things that other people are good at. Oh, so we can reflect on your relationship to others as well as just within your own mind. Right. But yeah. both are cognitive distortions and inaccuracies and they're therefore like they kind of lead into trouble. Okay. Yeah. I guess one, one question, this might be a nuance that I had was when you say like cognitive distortions, couldn't there be a scenario in which it's actually like not a distortion? Like in hy- like hypothetically, if I'm, if I genuinely am, you know, awful at this one thing, like it might be true in that sense, right? Yeah. So actually they found that people who are slightly depressed are actually probably more accurate at oh, judging reality. So for example, Winston Churchill, who struggled with depression was thought to be one of the early sort of, you know, bell sounders for how bad Germany was getting. Whereas a lot of people were in denial. Huh. So sometimes, you know, having a war leader who's a little bit um, depressed can actually see reality a little bit more accurately. That's wild. There was a, a TED talk by the journalist uh, Andrew Solomon uh, about his own experience with depression. And he totally mentions that point where he's talking about how one of the reasons people don't like having depressed people around is that they often like speak truths that are like socially, you know, maybe unpopular, like, you know, we're all just going to die someday. It's like, well, that's actually a true statement, but it's not like we go around saying that all the time. Yeah. And, you know, I, I think that there's, there's probably a place where it's, (laughs) it's more true. And then the further you go into depression, the more like untrue it becomes, you know, the more distorted it becomes, the the more distorted. So I think that there's, you know, like on this sort of bell curve of natural mood, you know, maybe slightly tilted towards more depression, um, you would have more accurate thoughts to some degree. But I don't know if that's necessarily always advantageous. Okay. In, in certain circumstances, it is adaptive to yeah. have some of those. I guess my next question for you is, as a clinician yourself, how do you go about identifying these patterns of thinking in your clients? Right. So when I'm doing more of a cognitive approach, um, you know, and I'm asking them to kind of identify hot thoughts or those thoughts that are kind of associated with the depression or with the shame, we may actually, I may actually then, um, you know, ask them if, if any sort of cognitive distortions apply. And I may, I usually try to help them help themselves because when I'm gone, I want them to be able to continue to be able to look at these cognitive distortions and to continue to be able to sort of, um, bring themselves more towards truth. Mm. Okay. So you're trying to actually train the patient to almost become his own therapist in some way. Yeah. It's kind of developing a muscle the way that I see it, um, and in our partial programs, um, like those are day treatment hospital programs, they do a lot of this sort of thing and they do it over and over and over again with the idea that if you do it over and over again enough, your brain is like a muscle, your brain will wire in new ways. And if your brain can wire that whenever you have like a distorted thought to kind of bring more accuracy or truth to it, that's going to help a lot. Got it. So could you kind of give me like a clinical example of you talking with a patient, identifying a distortion and then working with him or her to rectify it and learn to recognize it, him or herself? Okay. So like, let's say, um, so let's say I had a student come and they said that they failed an exam Sure. and, uh, or a, uh, an attending gave them a little, a slight critical remark. Yeah. And so they felt you know, very depressed. And the sort of the hot thought we identify is I am, I'm stupid. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And so what I might do is have them actually look at this list of cognitive distortions and look at like black or white thinking. And so like kind of we'll look at the definition together, you know, black or white thinking, you know, you're, you're basically taking something and you're going all bad or, you know, all good on it, Mm. you know, does that apply to this? And they'll go, yeah, you know, like, I think, you know, I did do a lot of other tests that were successful and I've been successful in undergrad. And, you know, I, 
I have had some mentors who really like working with me and who are really positive. Um, and then we'll look at like, um, the second one over generalization and, you know, are you overgeneralizing or, you know, kind of taking one statement and making it, you know, kind of a blanket statement for all realities yeah. rather than like seeing the complete picture of, of life and how you're doing here. Uh, and they may say, yeah, you know, I, I, I think that one applies to me also because, um, you know, I'm, I did do well on other tests and, you know, I did have mm -hmm. other good experiences. So that, that one's fairly similar to black and white thinking. Another one is mental filter, focusing on the negative rather than the whole picture. Okay. What do you mean? So you focus on that one negative, so like a mental filter, like a negative mental filter. So basically a filter is something that like blocks like bigger objects, right? From going through. So if you're like filtering out, you know, noodles, the noodles are not going through the water is right. Right. So imagine the water here is those bad critical remarks you hear from other people. Yeah. And the noodles is like the good remarks okay, or, or the neutral remarks. And so you, your, your mental filter only is, is the, the water hitting you. Yeah. And so you're completely filtering out the negative parts oh. of the day or the positive parts of the day. You're, fil you're filtering those out. I feel like at least speaking for myself, I do that so naturally. Like I will, re I will remember the one critical remark, you know, in 10 compliments. Like, it, is that just kind of natural to human psychology is like we, we prey on and obsess over um, negative aspects about us. Yeah. I, you know, feedback, it's hard to get good at receiving feedback. I'm not sure like how to become better at that other than, you know, just kind of a mindset change Yeah, that like feedback is information. It's not good or bad. Maybe it's meant to help you grow. Um, you know, all feedback is just information. You know, we can like thank them for it and then think if we want to accept it later mm. or bounce it off of like the other realities or other sort of, you know, so we're looking at, so we're not overgeneralizing that one piece of feedback, you know? Right, right. But I, it's hard. It's really hard. And I think it stops people from doing things. Really? Like how so? Well, like think about it. I mean, like uh, if you get some negative feedback from certain attendings, do you really want to go into their specialty? You know, do you really want to be on that rotation anymore? Do you want to show yeah. up um, and work hard for them? Yeah, I definitely had that experience uh, with psychiatry you know, last year. <laughs> oh no! And it it kind of put me off the path for a while, but I know exactly what you mean. It, the emotional response to to that and firing up all my own, you know, distor distortions can generate enough negative emotion to kind of sway, you know, my whole entire career path. And I'm sure I'm not the only one who's experienced that. Yeah. So, okay. Your, your question though is like, why do we have a negative mental filter? Yeah. <clears throat> um, and I think, I think it's because it's sometimes it's, it's like advent, it's advantageous <laughs> and adaptive for us to focus on things that are going to put us in danger and things that are going to, um, keep us alive. That makes sense. Right. So like if, if you can see like that sort of piece of information as like, you know, often it may feel like this is a life or death situation, you know, like if I don't accept this feedback, I may die, you know, or like, yeah, I may not go on living as, as well. And so it's like, we may pay attention to that and it may sort of like, you know, light up our fear centers and our anxiety centers more. And, um, it also comes against like the way that we saw ourselves. So you may have hmm. seen yourself as like, I am a great potential psychiatrist, you know? And then yeah. this like one piece of information kind of like pokes a hole in that. And you're yeah. like, well, maybe this sort of image that I've had of myself is not true. Um, so yeah, those can be difficult parts. What, what can I ask what the bad feedback was? Yeah, absolutely. Um, it was, it was somebody that I think I was trying too hard to impress because my advisor had said, Hey, you really need a letter from this person. And so it, I, I think I just say that to kind of 
frame the emotional response to getting, you know, like nine pieces of really good feedback from her at the end of the rotation. But this one piece that was like, hey, uh, you, I think she said something like, I have a tendency to like speak over people or interrupt them. Right. And, it, and that was like, and, and, and so she kind of like, it was more of like a character critique. Right. And, and so yeah, it, it was that like, hurts. yeah, I know. And, yeah. and if, I think if you felt like it was an attack on your character. It, it did. And, and, you know, I, I'm not saying she was wrong, but I think that particularly like the way she framed it kind of, or the way she communicated that feedback, it, it, it made me feel like attacked, you know? And I, and I definitely felt like, all the, you know, psychophysiological mechanisms activating and kind of a fight or flight almost response. Because the image that I was telling myself about myself had been cracked a little bit, like you said. Yeah, I could see that that would be frustrating for you to receive that. Um, yeah. And I want to affirm that I've not <laughs> experienced that same reality from you. I don't, I, I've never, that's never crossed my mind. Adam to oh. over, talks <laughs> over me or talks over other people when I'm well. Thanks, David. You yeah. know, <laughs> so no one would be super some, sensitive. Yeah. Sometimes when we receive feedback like that, we need to sort of yeah, you know, ask other people for truth. You know, like, hey, can you give me a piece of truth here? <laughs> you know, help me out totally. Because I'm like going all black and white on myself, you know, and overgeneralizing, and I have this negative mental filter. Um, and I think especially when the feed, who, like who the feedback comes from is huge as well. Right. Right. Like if it's this person in my head who I've built up is this like, you know, person, like this huge authority figure that I need to impress and suddenly I'm getting, you know, condemnation. It's a lot worse than if it was like, you know, my, my nephew who said, stop interrupting me or something like that. Right. And potentially also this person is between you and your goal Absolutely. of becoming a, a good psychiatrist and yeah. becoming a psychiatrist resident. Yeah. So you're like, okay, is this letter of recommendation going to have this piece of information in there? Yeah, exactly. Um, which, you know, would be like kind of a red flag for some like program director who's reading through it. Yeah. You know, if they were doing a closer read. Um, <laughs> <laughs> for sure. But um, yeah. Wow. Okay. But yeah, that's kind of the the med student experience and probably other people's experience as well of perpetually trying to, you know, overcome this hierarchical nature and deal with the emotional feedback from that. Yeah, no, I think it's really hard to to hear that feedback. Um, do you think, so looking at the distortions yeah. we've gone over, do you think there was any, what kind of thoughts came after that? So you're at home thinking yeah. about things like what kind of thoughts were attached to that? Yeah. So I definitely identify a few of these. So like number five, like jumping to conclusions, I think applies to me. Um, Cause I think I did some, some mind reading of her, which is another one. It's a subcategory of jumping to conclusions. Cause I, I think I interpreted that and I blew it up into oh my gosh, you know, she thinks I'm a terrible applicant or I'm a terrible, I'd be an awful psychiatrist. So I, I jumped to the conclusion that I'm no good for this line of work. Wow. You know, okay. and it, I realized, and I think I realized in the moment that that's, you know, absurd, but. No, but it's hard to, it's hard yeah. to feel that. I mean, yeah. cause then it's kind of like, yeah, it just feels really heavy. Yeah. And, and that can kind of go with, all or nothing thinking like I'm either, you know, a great med student, you know, five out of five or, or I'm, you know, this abysmal, you know, monstrosity, you know, that, uh, is, you know, terrible in teams, et cetera, you know? Yeah. Okay. So you're jumping to conclusions. Yes. You're, I'm you're, um, all or nothing, all or nothing thinking. Okay. Any of the other ones jump out at you? Let's see. Emotional reasoning, number seven, um, which kind of says, I assume that my negative emotions necessarily reflect the things, the way things really are. So I, I think I, because I had such an emotional response to that, my, my whole like career outlook in that moment felt bleak because it was like, even though it was just this tiny mm. little moment and she was probably like genuinely trying to help me. Um, but it, it felt in that moment, like, uh, I, I, seeing through the cloud of my emotions, it felt like 
you know, the whole future was a lot less, you know, optimistic than it had been prior. Yeah. You're not going to be, you're not going to get a good letter. Yeah. You're not going to. She's going to tell everybody else in the department that I'm, you know, a flop, you know, oh, if I, God. things like that. No, you I know? mean, that's like a real, yeah, I, that's a real concern at that stage, you know, when you get some negative feedback and I've definitely been there Yeah, from, um, and I can, I don't even know if like I have that person, the right person in my mind who I'm thinking about, but there's other people who like, you know, oh, <laughs> it's, it's so hard to to hear that sort of negative feedback and then like about students feel crushed. Or, oh, about myself. Oh, about yourself. Yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm yeah. thinking like when I get, you know, <laughs> negative feedback. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. It's like, should I be doing what I'm doing? Yeah. There's, there's the sort of imposter syndrome that creeps in. Like oh, I'm an yeah. imposter. I'm not really, you know, as good as, you know, I'm, I am supposed to be, or as I should be. Oh no! Shitting on totally. yourself. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Um, you know, there's a. Uh, yeah. Any other of them jump out? We're looking. We'll, we'll put these summary on the the show notes. Yeah. With the numbers, so people can have that. Um. I I think the last big one that I'll identify that we 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 hit on was disqualifying the positive. And that's really similar to the mental filter with the spaghetti metaphor that you used. Cause it's like, for example, in my case, there was an evaluation sheet and there were like 10 items on there, like, um, had a positive attitude, worked well with the team, showed up on time, you know, all these means of categorizing us. Mm -hmm. And it's like, I, I, you know, she liked me on a lot of them. You know, I was, I was good on, but there was just that one. And then that's, you know, the one that I chose to obsess over. Right. So it, it's definitely that. I, my brain automatically disqualifies any positive feedback and hones in on the negative repercussions of that one. Yeah. Yeah. So disqualifying any positive feedback and just focusing on the negative would be a cognitive distortion. So, okay. So like if you were to summarize the statement at the time that you felt, yeah. yeah. what would that statement be? I think, I think the statement for me would be you know, because this attending says I'm, you know, a rude med student, I must be, you know, that's all that I am, or I'm, I'm only a bad med student. Okay. Now looking, now having some space from when that happened. Sure. And having looked at these cognitive distortions, how would you more accurately put that statement? Yeah. So I, I think I would reframe it with something like, you know, this attending, you know, made the comment that I'm, I did some rude gesture or I, I did some rude, um, you know, actions, you know, in her presence. Um, and this may or may not, you know, reflect reality, but regardless, even if it does re reflect reality, um, I'm still a successful med student and I can become better as a result. And that's not the only thing that, you know, defines my worth as a applicant, as a future psychiatrist. Good. I mean, that, Good. Was, that was probably longer yeah. than you meant, but no, I think I think that's <clears> perfect. <throat> I think it's perfect, and I want to affirm that. Um, <laughs> I think you're going to be an amazing psychiatrist oh, someday. Thanks, David. That means a I lot. I really believe that. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I uh, I really believe that. So, See, just a couple of other questions, okay? Because sure. you know, I'm, these are. Um, it makes sense, you know, when we're discussing them. But I'm, I'm. You mentioned that when you're dealing with clients who have issues like this, or honestly, even with me just now on that example, would you give me any like homework or things to work on when we leave this session, for example? Yeah, I, I think first of all, I recommend to have this printed out and keep it in your pocket for at least the first couple of weeks that you kind of, um are learning these so that they're really like in your mind, you're looking at them. Whenever you have a thought, you can pull the paper out and kind of go through them and see which ones are the most distorted. And I would, I would also recommend throughout the day to journal. Like if you have any of those statements to simplify it as like, I am a rude medical student. Yeah. According to everyone. Yeah. You know, or something like yeah. that, write down that. And then if it, I have them write down, uh, you know, 
all or nothing thinking, over the generalization, applies to this statement. So it kind of like kind of go through the list and write down. There's something about writing something down. It takes it out of kind of the emotional abyss of the brain and kind of makes it more concrete. Mm. So actually writing down the which distortions apply and maybe even how they apply, and then writing down a summary statement hmm. for like the most accurate version they can create. Okay. So like what you told me, have them actually yeah. write that down. And the more that you do this, the more your brain will get used to naturally um, and without so much effort um, coming to more accurate representations of reality. Okay. Do you, so that like so you're saying so let's say I'm walking down you know uh, the street and thought jumps in something reminds me of that experience and I think God I'm I'm a failure I'm I'm such a rude bad person would, would you would you recommend in that moment or you know when I got home or whatever then doing the journal thing or is there something then that I can do to yeah so I mean you could even jump on your phone your notepad on okay. your phone you know pull out your list of cognitive distortions write out, you know, I'm stupid. And then look at the cognitive distortions. I'm using a negative mental filter. Yeah. I'm going all or nothing thinking over generalization, you know, disqualifying the positive, you know, whatever they are for you, whatever you can sort of make sense of. And then trying to sort of create a more accurate statement. Okay. Okay. And I would also say like, this is something that if you are, if you are wanting to do this um, and you're having a hard time doing it, then, you know, finding a therapist, mm-hmm. uh, help, having someone help you sort of look at the cognitive distortions and then come up with ac- more accurate statements or at least look at your journal, see if you're doing it correct. Um, there's workbooks that you can get. Um, I'll put a list of them okay. in the show notes, um, ones that I recommend to people. Yeah, when so, I when I googled this before the show, um, there's lots of like PDFs online that you can just like print off. And, right. So right. yeah, there's lots of resources available. It seems. Yeah, and I would even make your own list. So like, make like write down black or white thinking on a piece of paper for yourself, and write what does that mean for yourself mm. after looking at maybe some of the PDFs online. So it's you own it. You know. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Anything you feel like we haven't covered with cognitive distortions? Um, Let's see. Uh, I think, I think that's good. Okay. Yeah. I think we covered some good stuff. Um, I think there's uh, probably more, um, more that can be developed, but I think that's a good start from that. You know, if you're listening to this and you have any questions, if you have any sort of particular petitions relating to this that you want us to cover on future episodes, I would love love to hear back. So you can put that um, on the website. Uh, if you follow the show notes, the website and put it in the comment section, that would be awesome. But thank you for listening and have a great day. All right. You know... After doing this um, and thinking about it for a couple couple weeks now before this episode, as I brought this out to some patients, they initially didn't feel heard or understood in their sort of emotional experiences or predicaments. And I think I think we always have to start with the experience of the other and validate and give empathy to it before we try to apply cognitive distortions to it or have them try to work it out because it can be a little bit jarring to the experience of someone, I think, sometimes to just jump to, that's not true, let's look at how it's an error. So I think what's really important here is to um, start with connection, start with empathy, and then, you know, as you introduce this idea to someone that they could have distorted thinking and that we're going to be applying, you know, some sort of rules and looking at how we can best uh, move towards more accurate thoughts. Um, That's sort of a, a process. And if you, if you are doing this with someone else and they recoil from this sort of, you know, sharing of here's some cognitive distortions, you might need to introduce it in a different way or um, kind of introduce it slowly, 
you know, having the person kind of own their ex- their experience and not just pointing out, you know, this is a cognitive distortion here or there. Okay, on that note, we are going to end this session. And um, thank you, Adam, for joining us. And, you know, if you have any questions, once again, please post them either on the website or on my Instagram on the post related to cognitive distortions. And I would love to to hear your questions, your thoughts. Hopefully this was helpful for you. If it was, if you share it, that would be awesome. If you leave me a review uh, on Stitcher or iTunes or wherever you're listening to this, uh, that's a good review. I would be most grateful. All right. Have a good day. Once again, if this podcast was of help to you, I'm leaving in my show notes a free resource, which is an eight-day assignment, kind of working through some of the principles that will allow you to move away from some of these negative feelings and towards gratitude. And if you're a mental health professional, it's really good to practice this yourself so that you can better be able to help other people. And if you're someone just listening to this, curious about mental health, this may be a perfect resource for you to really bring these on a practical level into your life.